duktelinių bendrovių ir paskesnių eilių, bendrovių duomenų atskleidimą, viešinimą ir skelbimą. Tai kas šiek tiek nustebino neigiamą prasme, kad šiai dienai susidūrėm rengdami pačius pakeitimus, kad yra toleruotina ar buvo toleruotina, sakykim, situacijose, situacija tuose dukterinėse, bendrovėse ar paskesnėse eilėse, neturėti, pavyzdžiui, internetinių puslapių, nenurodyti buvėjai, nes neskelbti duomenų elementarių apie finansinės ataskaitės ir taip toliau, na ir kai ieškai apie tokias įmonės, kurios ta jau doktrininė prasme yra įsteigtos iš valstybės kapitalo rekvizitą LT, ieškai apie jas duomenų, na tai šitą situaciją turėjo pasikeitis tai iš esmės ir buvo sukonkretinti reikalavimai be abejo doktrininėms bendrovėms dėl to, kad tie duomenys būtų viešinami, konsolidojami ir rodomi arba holdingo apimtyje, arba atskirai turimi tie internetiniai puslapiai ir būtų skelbiami. Na, iš to, ką visą susakiau, galima būtų apibendritai pasakyti, kad valdysenai ir skaidrumo standartai pačiose valstybės valdomos įmonėse labai skiriasi, arba matosi tokie lyderiai, kurie būtų galima išskirti kaip bendrai valstybės mastų net ir pavyzdys privačiam sektoriui, tai kalbu pirmiausia apie energetikos įmonių, Įmonės tai yra ir Klaipėdos naftai, ir Epsogė, ir Ignitis, bet yra ir tam tikros įmonės, kurios toleruoja tą situaciją ir eilė metų kaip nesikeičia, sakykim, tą situaciją skaidrumo ir korupcijos prevencijos priemonių. Tai tikime, kad jinai su laiku išsilygins, kadangi yra įmonių sparčiai besivienčių susiekimo sektorė, sektorių ekonomikos inovacijų ministerijos, kurios vejasi tą aukščiausio lygio standartą. Bendrai skaidrumo situacija pagal valdymo koordinavimo centro atliktų styrimus, kiek tai susiję su valdysenos indeksu, tai vertinta vidutiniškai yra. Tai dėl to, kad kaip inėjau, yra pakankamai skirtingos atskirtis tarp pačių įmonių, bet kačių atskaitomybės rytyje, gerėja metinių pranešimų kokybė, duomenų atskleidimas kaip inėta interneto svetainėse, taip pat įmonių, kurios aktualizuoja tvaraus verslo vystimo praktikas ir atitinkamai korupcijos prevencijos priemonės, na, kalbant apie korupcijos prevencijos priemonės, reiktų paminėti, kad dar šiek tiek trūksta sistemiškumo, bet Tikime šią situaciją keisti, tai viena iš tokių priemonių, tai kartu su specialiųjų tyrimų tarnybą turime parengti antikorupcinės aplinkos kūrimo ir integralumo valstybės ir savo valdybės valdomose įmonėse vadovą. Tai siekis šio vadovų užtikrinti antikorupcinį švietimą, informatumą ir taip toliau, na ir noras yra sistemizuoti tą korupcijos prevencijos pačią sistemą vavairės svai, padaryti tą dokumentą tokio praktinio daugiau naudojimo, kad paimti praktikas iš geriausias, iš privataus sektorios, taikyti be abejo jas ir tam vadinam valstybiniam sektoriui, turėti tą dokumentą skirtą plačiam subjektu ratų tiek vadovybėj, tiek valdybėj, tiek darbuotojams, tiek plačiai visuomeniai šių įmonių. Na ir artimiausių metų turbūt tas vadovas bus projektiniai stadijoje jau derinamas tarp institucijų, na vėliau ir pristatytas visuomeniai renginėje bendram su tarnyba, manau, dar šitą išsigrįninsim. Tai pabaigai iš viso to, ką ką minėjau, nes turbūt šiek tiek užgaišau, jau norėčiau pasakyti, kad bendrai tai ministerija labai tikis proveržia su įmonių pertvarkos planu ir visomis numatytomis priemonėmis, bet kadangi platus subjektų ratas dalyvauja tame ir atskiros ministerijos, tai iš tikrųjų pareikalau susitelkimo ir to bendradarbiavimo tiek iš pačių įmonių, tiek iš institucijų, kurio ir sulaukėm iš tikrųjų, bet ateityje tikime sulaukti dar daugiau, kad priemonės būtų pasiektos. Ačiū Valerai. Didelis, ačiū už intro, iš jūsų pusės, už akcentų sudėliojimą, kas yra svarbu visam valstybinėm sektoriu, ar ne, valstybės valdomomis, valdybių valdomom įmonėm. Žydrūna, ar pavyko jums prisijungti, ar galim girdėti jūs? Pabandom, ar girdėti? Girdim, Žydrūna, labai manau jūs girdėti, tai duodžiu žodį jums. Tai labai malonu ir liūdai mes turim Svečia, tai aš pabandysiu gal ir pereiti prie angliškosios mūsų webinaro dalies ir pabandysiu kreiptis anglų kalbą. Good afternoon for all of you and it's pleasure for me to take part today in this webinar and to have this webinar. 
and uh, uh, thank you, Ludas, for for in, uh, your initiative to organize uh, this kind of uh, of webinar with this topic, because it's very important to talk about that. And uh, I am glad that this webinar is in the frame of Integrity Academy. Uh, most of you, uh, of course, know what does it mean, Integrity Academy. It is quite new thing in Lithuania. Uh, this project is for sharing experience, anti-corruption ex experience. And uh, since the beginning of this year, we started with uh, uh, webinars in anti-corruption topics. But uh, recently, we uh, went to second stage. And we start to uh, work with our uh, Integrity Academy's participants. And I would like to mention that uh, now we have 21 participants uh, who said that we would like to create anti-corruption environment in our organization, but we do not know how. Please help us. And uh, uh, it, it is nice that 12 of 12 of these 21 participants are state or municipally owned enterprises. They are quite active in this process. They would like to create anti-corruption environment and it is good news. And uh, one another thing is that uh, we have experts in our Integrity Academy. Uh, these experts are from organizations uh, what already created anti-corruption environment, quite good uh, anti-corruption environment in their organizations. And four of these experts are uh, also from uh, state or municipally owned uh, enterprises. So uh, I would like to, 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 to say that uh, uh, these uh, organizations are quite active in creating anti-corruption environment, but Lithuania is not uh, a unique country. We can, of course, create our own standards of transparency and uh, develop uh, them, but uh, uh, always it's good to look around, to look for best practices around, around our region, in, 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 in all uh, the world, and to look what can we do better. So our guest, dear Alison, is here with us today, and uh, I hope that uh, today we will have very good discussion, very good presentation about standards, about guidelines, where could we move with our anti-corruption uh, uh, environment, anti-corruption process. So have a good time, have a good discussion, have a good presentation. Ludas, thank you once again. And uh, have a good time, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jidrunas. Now, Alison, thank you very much for your patience there. Couple of intro remarks from my side on the technicalities, right? Because as Jidruna said, the purpose here is not only to hear from Alison, the presentation of hers, uh, but also to have the discussion. Uh, for those who are not comfortable to say out loud the questions in English, Please don't be shy to say it out loud in Lithuanian. I would be more than happy to help and assist in translation there, that the dialogue would be uh, thorough there. Now, then on my side, um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have Alison on, on this discussion, on this webinar today. Uh, a couple of words from my side about Alison, and then I'm sure that she will be able to, you know, put anything on top. So uh, with Alison, we met a month or so ago um, uh, during the uh, you know, business integrity survey that we have done uh, presentation, the preliminary result. And Alison was um, the one who was presenting the uh, SOE business integrity guidelines there. And being a member of the Integrity Academy in, in Lithuania, I thought that this would be a wonderful topic to present having in mind all the initiatives that uh, both the um, uh, STT is organizing, uh, also the ministry is organizing, knowing the focus of Lithuania to building a better and stronger integrity climate, climate among SOEs. So a couple of words about Alison. Alison has worked for eight years as a policy analyst in OECD on integrity in state-owned enterprises and the public sector uh, more broadly. Um, she also worked on a similar topics at the Transparency International Secretariat in Berlin. Previously, uh, Alison managed a research project for the London School of Economics and Harvard Business School 
on good practice in private sector management. And that's why I think that, you know, having her today is a wonderful, wonderful match with all the expectations that uh, have been set out loud, right? So Alison has honors degree in economics, master's in the international policy. And uh, I think that, uh, yes, again, it's wonderful to have you here, Alison. So uh, without further ado, I think that I will give a word to you and uh, uh, very happy to see the presentation of yours. Excellent. Thank you, Ludas, and, and thank you, Zidrunas, uh, and, and uh, others for, for the opening remarks. I wish I could understand Lithuanian. I couldn't hear the first introductory remarks, but uh, I appreciate it all the same. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to have been invited to present in this um, Integrity Academy. I know that it's a new initiative, but it's an excellent one, and it's the type of activity that we are recommending uh, in our work streams to other countries to follow. So first of all, the first thing for me to say is congratulations on this initiative. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm very honored to have been invited to present. Uh, so on that note, I will share my screen or I will attempt to. So you're going to have to tell me whether uh, it's coming up appropriately. It'll just take me one minute. Um, so are you seeing it appear on the screen? Not yet, at least. Not yet. Yes, Usually we have takes, it. It yes, takes we have a minute it. or so. All right. And then I will confirm, um, I'll ask you to confirm that you, when I when I launch it, that you're seeing just the PowerPoint and not the, the behind the scenes. Is that correct? Yes. So Excellent. The PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, uh, so it's a go then. Uh, so yes. So thanks for the introduction. Um, as was mentioned, I'm I'm working at the OECD uh, primarily on integrity and state-owned enterprises, but also corporate governance. Uh, and I have been doing this for years. And then previously, I worked on from the public governance side. I was working on integrity uh, in the public sector more broadly. Uh, so. I would like today to just provide a bit of an overview of the different tools that the OECD offers uh, and the types of work that we're doing in this space, in this field. Um, and so this is the, the series, if you will, that's particularly relevant to our discussions today. Um, first, in 2005, the OECD issued the Guidelines on Corporate Governance of State-Owned Enterprises. Um, I believe many of you are familiar with this, given that it was this instrument that uh, Lithuania was reviewed against for the, um, for the accession process to the OECD. Uh, so this review was done, I believe, in 2014 um, uh, as, part of, yeah, as part of the accession process. Uh, those guidelines, the, the SOE guidelines, they were revised in 2014, uh, 2015 rather, um, and updated with some to reflect some of the uh, the the steps that countries had made um, and some of the changes in in the SOE environment. Um, I should mention too that at the OECD, we're of course working primarily with governments, with the public sector. So. The work that I'm doing is in support of usually the state ownership representative. Um, and so in this case, in, in Lithuania, uh, for instance, there's the, I think it's the VKC, the Coordination Center. Uh, and of course, then in conjunction with, with line ministries, but it's usually the state level that we're, that we're working to support. Uh, but usually, and what we've heard is that uh, SOEs find the work also very beneficial and other stakeholders too, who wish to hold the state owner accountable. So while it's targeted at the state owner, normally it's also valuable um, for other stakeholders as well. So in 2018, we issued a report that looked specifically at the issue of SOEs and corruption. And this was following a few years of um, headlines, let's say, but also evidence coming out from around the world that there may be uh, particularly particular risks when it comes to SOE integrity. Uh, I mentioned Petrobras as a as a well known example, but also the the MDB one scandal in um, in Malaysia. So the delegates to the OECD said they wanted to find out more about anti corruption in SOEs and what can be done about it. So we did a stock taking report. We surveyed over two hundred SOEs as well as almost thirty state level state owners. And the results were pre presented in that report, um, but I'm going to go through some of those survey results too. And I think they they may be of interest to you. 
we followed up that research with uh, with the standard. So we took a look at what the numbers were telling us, uh, and we issued a new set of guidelines to accompany this uh, this this new set of guidelines to accompany the SOE guidelines. These we call the ACI guidelines. So this is just um, OECD terminology acronyms. Um, and this is the, the international standard that I'll speak mostly to you about today. Um, but most recently, and I'll also present this, we issued an implementation guide. And this tool is really to support countries in implementing the guidelines um, that, I, that I'm mentioning. And uh, so I'll get into that in more detail. So that was just a few months ago that we launched this implementation guide. So firstly, I just want to take a moment to explain uh, the landscape of, of SOEs, how they're active in the marketplace, because certainly SOEs are uh, often not active in the marketplace. They're serving primarily public policy objectives or, or public service obligations, um, but more often than not, they're also active in the marketplace. And so we see a need, of course, for, for corporate governance um, in that area. Right now, at least at our last count, we found uh, that over 100 now of the world's 500, 500 largest companies are state-owned enterprises. And this has tripled from 2000. Of course, you see on the left side, one of the main reasons for this is China and then the, the explosion of a large state-owned companies. But it's not only that. Um, and we see uh, other emerging markets and um, other non-EU countries primarily uh, having SOEs that are, are reaching the list of over the, the largest companies in the world. When SOEs are operating in the marketplace, we see uh, on the left here that they're usually concentrated in network industries uh, and in the financial sector. And I think it, at least with regards to the primary sectors, transport, electricity and gas, this is similar to what I understand is the case in Lithuania. Um, now, I should mention that the, the largest portfolios of SOEs, so that is the, the greatest number of SOEs are usually in emerging markets and post transition economies. But so so as we've seen a rise in the size of uh, uh, the the sort of the power of SOEs, and we also see uh, uh, expanding um, SOEs also in emerging markets. This has actually created somewhat of a sectoral shift because emerging markets are usually uh, have a more diverse uh, um, field of activity of SOEs. So what you see here on the screen is actually mainly for OECD member countries. Uh, so, so SOE uh, activity is diversifying in some ways. Um, SOEs are, are more active internationally now, and we see this through instance through mergers and acquisitions, uh, but they're operating more and more abroad in the, re the last decade. And I just wanted to highlight on the right there, we have done some research about um, the, the ownership of the world's largest uh, listed companies. So this is listed companies, but we see here that actually aside from institutional investors, uh, well, and other free flow, that the public sector actually does have uh, quite a large ownership of, of some of the world's largest listed companies. So they're also active in stock exchanges and, and in public listings, the state. So now just a few words on the, the OECD SOB guidelines. Um, this is what I mentioned. This is on purely corporate governance. Um, and this is our main tool for promoting efficiency and transparency and accountability. And the guidelines on anti-corruption, which I'll get into, uh, are a complement to this particular instrument. But the basic premise of this instrument is that there needs to be a balance in an, a passive ownership so state owners that are essentially again, passive, um, not, not very active, versus an excessive intervention. So they're overly active in a way that does not leave uh, the SOE autonomy. Uh, we also say in this essentially a basic premise is that uh, SOE should, should be operated similarly to listed companies to the extent possible. So more corporate uh, and more autonomous. Um, there need to be clear separation of roles and responsibilities, particularly between the state owner and, and the board, but also the board and executive management. Um, 
and that it should be, of course, in a rules based environment. So where rule of law adheres. Uh, now, one of the reasons that this instrument is particularly important to the discussion today, too, is because we we talk often about SOEs in a level playing field. So this is ensuring that the SOEs are not um, subject to um, advantages over other private firms that they're competing with in the market, but also not disadvantaged, um, that they're not giving disadvantages because of the fact that they're also state owned. So again, it's a level playing field. But what our research has shown is actually that it, in certain cases, it's not a level playing field. SOEs often have lower rates of return uh, and they may be more leveraged, so taking on more debt. Um, and we had an example, uh, the OECD also works on steel. Um, there's a steel committee, if you believe it, um, where we saw that actually SOEs were less likely to be closed when closures were required, even though they were less efficient and performing less. So this was one example for us of, of the potential uh, issue with regards to a level playing field and then also act actions that are taken. So I have there, uh, you know, what can we take away from this? What are the interpretations? Well, state ownership does not automatically mean high performance. They may not be, SOEs may not be maximizing productivity or profitability. Uh, and there are some good reasons for that. That could be, um, or at least there are some explanations for that. Many SOEs say it's down to the fact that there's public policy objectives, um, but that's a difficult discussion to have. Uh, because ideally all SOEs should be performing well. Um, and there's also the suggestion that SOEs may be less risk averse to taking on greater risk because of the state ownership, um, uh, because they're owned by the state. And then of course, the subject of today, there could be abuse or exploitation uh, or corruption in the SOE sector. So with that, I would move into the, the survey that I was referring to, um, the, the state-owned enterprises and corruption report. Uh, so this survey was done in 2017 and it uh, confidentially surveyed um, over 200 SOEs, but multiple representatives within the SOEs. So we had over 360 SOE leaders um, provide confidential responses. So in each in each SOE, we often had responses from the chair of the board, um, the head of compliance or risk, as well as the CEO. So it gave us an interesting idea of, um, of the situation within one individual company. We also broke the information down sectorally. So what we found when we asked SOEs uh, whether or not they had witnessed corruption or irregularities in their companies in recent years, those who were in oil and gas or mining or postal were more likely to have said, yes, they did. Um, you see, so they responded either yes, no, or I don't know. Um, so we, we've we deduced and, and um, anecdotal evidence also supports that uh, it is the case that certain sectors, uh, particularly oil and gas or, um, or mining, for instance, can, can in certain cases be at a higher risk. We've found, uh, at least in the words of SOEs, that all levels of the corporate hierarchy can be involved. So this means uh, when we asked SOEs that had seen irregularities in their company, we said who was we asked who was involved, and this was the response. So 70% of the SOEs said well uh, said employees were involved. 42% of the SOEs said mid-level managers were involved, and so on and so forth. But the important thing here is not the specific percentage, but rather to show that um, risk can arise at the employee level, at the executive manage level, and also from externals. So business partners um, or third parties, of course, as we know, uh, can also pose a risk um, to the integrity of the SOE. We've also found, sort of, as I mentioned, that risks can be both ex internal and external to the company. So we asked all of these, so over 200 SOEs around the world um, to rank these, this list of risks for the likelihood that they would occur in their company uh, between, uh, you know, from low, medium, high, uh, and as well as the impact that 
would have if this risk materialized in their company. Uh, and so while you know we we have, for instance, uh, potentially lower impact here. This is the risk of receiving bribes. We have potentially lower uh, lower likelihood, but a, a higher impact. So the idea being that typically the risks uh, falling here would be uh, probably treated outside of the risk tolerance of a company, and thus um, and thus something to be addressed in the internal control system, the risk management system of a company. What's interesting about this is that, of course, this is a common tool used within companies, within SOEs or companies, um, to help define um, define risk tolerance and what falls outside of it. But it might be interesting for companies to assess their own uh, likelihood and impact of risks against the global um, the global averages that we see here. It may also be a tool for state ownership representatives too. And they're trying to understand where the risks are within their SOE portfolios. So across the SOEs that they're responsible for overseeing. We also asked uh, SOEs to tell us what um, what the main challenges were to integrity in the companies, in their companies. Uh, and again, this was confidential. This is the word of SOEs. And they said their number one challenge was a lack of a culture of integrity in the political and public sector. Now, this is again in the perspective of the SOEs, um, but this is something related to a concern, of course, that uh, I think the international community has more broadly about SOEs, which is that SOEs can be at risk of interference um, by representatives of the state um, in the company. And so this is this is a risk um, that, uh, um, or at least a, a challenge that SOEs raised. The second is simply a lack of awareness of, of um, understanding of company employees. And this is something that uh, Zitrunas mentioned uh, in his introductory remarks that companies are, are looking to um, essentially improve the culture of integrity and, and just the awareness of it uh, within the company. And that's great because we see this all around the world. Companies are coming to us, state ownership entities are coming to us and saying, um, you know, what's, uh, what can we do to improve that culture of integrity and, and raise awareness within the company? So you're not alone in Lithuania on this front. Um, SOEs are also concerned about opportunistic behavior of individuals. So this speaks more to, um, well, yes, uh, people seeking to exploit opportunities that arise. Normally, this comes up with at the company level, um, but it could also be from the state. Um, and, and so I'm not going to go through each one, but what's what's important here is that it highlights that the challenges are not only that, you know, there's a lack of controls. For instance, a company is is um, it does not have the, the right risk management process or controls in place. It, it's also that in certain cases, there's an override of controls. So that is uh, individuals are ignoring the rules or finding loopholes in the rules um, in order to seek undue advantage. And so this is where we see, for instance, um, an opportunistic behavior um, or the perception that they're not going to get caught. So I, I want to make uh, one final consideration about the data, one, one point. Um, and this is, I think, one that speaks very specifically to the situation of SOEs, um, because SOEs and private firms alike face risks of corruption. Um, of course, SOEs are, are not uh, unique in that sense. But there are there is evidence, of course, that SOEs, uh, there are aspects of SOE, SOEs operations that are somehow unique. And so the first is that in um, 2014, the OECD issued a report looking at foreign bribery cases over 15 years. So from 1999, Till 2014, um, the OECD analyzed concluded cases of foreign bribery. And what we found was that SOEs were offered more bribes, offered or given successfully, more bribes than any other public official, including top levels of government or customs officials that would require bribes, say, at, at borders. Um, 
so SOEs were, were always were, were more the target of bribes, foreign bribes. But what's interesting too is that the value of those bribes were was 80% of all the bribes offered, which means that SOEs are more often offered bribes and they're off and they're also higher value bribes. So they're they're offered more money in effect. So that's looking at SOEs in the public sector. Um, now, if we consider SOEs compared to private firms, um, we found that between this study I'm referring to and uh, another study where we asked private firms the same thing, we said, uh, have you undertaken any of these activities um, to mi mitigate uh, cor known corruption risk? So for instance, have you ceased operations in a particular jurisdiction? Have you um, taken disciplinary actions for violations? Have you uh, revised one a business project because of the corruption risks? Or have you even severed relations? Have you, have you cut ties with another firm uh, because of the risks present? And what we found is that private firms were doubly, at, at least twice as likely to have taken some of those steps. Um, as compared to SOEs. And so the working party, the OECD delegates, were considering this data and there are, potential, there are a couple of potential explanations for this. One is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, SOEs may feel, uh, may be taking on more risk. Um, and that could be either because they feel insulated uh, because they're state-owned, they may feel insulated from market forces, um, threat of bankruptcy, for instance, that private firms uh, may face. Uh, it, it may also have to do with the fact, though, that uh, SOEs have public service obligations and public policy objectives, and it's more difficult for them to cut ties with another company or to walk away from a particular jurisdiction um, when corruption risks are present. And so these are important nuances for SOEs that private firms uh, essentially don't, don't face. So the question then is, with all that said, what can be done about this? Um, and particularly, as mentioned, what can the state do? Because again, we're working to support uh, state owners. Now, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we have a set of guidelines, so an international standard, and uh, the the new implementation guide that helps implement that standard. Uh, so, just a few words about the new the new guidelines here, the standard. Uh, as as I said, it accompanies the other instrument SOE guidelines that we've had for years. Um, and what's interesting, though, about this particular uh, instrument is that it was developed by my part of the OECD that works on corporate governance of SOEs, but also uh, two other teams uh, and two other working groups. And one is the, the working group on bribery. So this is the anti-corruption space, does uh, enforcement, uh, sanctions, um, and monitors the, the anti-bribery convention. But we also did this in conjunction with um, the public sector integrity group, so, so those who could comment on the need for public sector integrity. And in doing this, the idea was that the, the instrument covers all the whole spectrum of what's needed to improve integrity in the SOE sector. And so I put on the screen here um, what we're calling the pillars of the ACI guidelines. So these are the four areas that we focus on. Um, first and foremost is integrity of the state owner, because we cannot expect SOEs to operate uh, perfectly uh, without risk of corruption or to to improve integrity if the integrity of the state is is lacking and as such that the, the public sector itself, the owner, uh, threatens the integrity of the company. So we start with that. Uh, we also talk about active and informed ownership. So again, this is the state's in exercising its role as an owner. So is that is that um, is that function of the government professional? Um, is it uh, is it efficient and effective? Thirdly, uh, we're looking at integrity at the company level. 
so this is where we get more into looking at, um, again, how the state can encourage companies to ensure they have the uh, risk management and control systems in place in the company. Maybe that there are whistleblowing channels and other mechanisms uh, like training to promote integrity in the company. And then finally, you see we have uh, a fourth pillar on accountability and enforcement. And the idea, of course, is that it, this ensures and supports um, the, the three areas that I, I just mentioned. But there are many provisions contained in these guidelines. Um, I should note that all of our instruments are aspirational in nature and not one OECD member country can say to have applied all of the provisions in these guidelines. So they're meant more to provide states with a roadmap as to what the good practice is and, and how to get there. So specifically on the how to get there, um, we, as mentioned, issued this implementation guide. And this guide then goes through um, and first looks for, for every pillar, so all of the four pillars I mentioned, it goes through and uh, discusses how the state can implement the recommendation. Um, why is the recommendation important? It covers uh, questions and answers that we often get about particular provisions, um, and which I'll show you. It uh, talks about what other sources might be useful, and it gives country examples. And I, I think I personally think that the greatest value of this guide is in the country examples, because we have country examples for every single provision in the guidelines. So whatever it is, the topic that you're interested in learning about, there will be at least one or two country examples to look at. Um, they don't go into a, a, a lot of detail, because the document would it's already long it's a you know over 100 pages but but um but what's nice of course is that it gives you at least a starting point uh and of course you could always follow up uh lithuania or other countries could always follow up with with us at the OECD to get more information or with the country directly um so so i think in particular this is the great value of this of this implementation guide so I'd like to go through now um, both the guidelines and the implementation guide to give a sense of, of what, uh, what it contain, what they contain. Um, so for instance, when we're talking about integrity of the state owner, we have uh, two sub-levels. One is applying high standards of conduct to the, to the state itself. Um, you know, how the state manages conflicts of interest uh, and whether they're hiring also um, in a merit-based way. We also have a second uh, sub-provision on um, ownership arrangements that support integrity. So this means, for example, um, making sure that the, uh, the ownership entity is separate or in Lithuania's case, the coordination center is separate from the regulatory function. Um, and so we avoid some conflict of interest there. But also, um, you know, the ownership arrangements should be such that uh, there's a, a clarity in roles and responsibilities between the state and the board so that the communication is, is clear uh, between the two. So to give an example of what appears in the implementation guide, this is one question that the guide covers. So, you know, it's it's it asks us. So um, ownership entities are required to be subject to high standards of conduct. And so how can the state actually do this? So we try to go through in detail um, how how this can be done. As regards the type of country examples we provide, um, again, as I mentioned, there is there are examples for every single provision. I give one example here on the screen. Um, so here it is. Uh, this is the the provision that suggests the state ownership should be subject to conflict of interest rules. Um, we have five five different um, examples there. Uh, from Chile to France to Latvia. Um, one example is in Switzerland that employees of the state ownership entity are not allowed to hold shares of SOEs, uh, or the UK uh, has a code of conduct applied to all members of the uh, of the coordination, the ownership coordination. And that's a fairly common uh, thing that we see across OECD countries. 
Moving to the second pillar, um, this is about active and informed state ownership. Uh, this is an OECD sort of terminology, active and informed ownership, uh, but it really does get at what we want to see. We want to see a degree of activity that is the right balance. So it's not passive, like I said, and it's not overly active or, or intervening either. Um, so within uh, active and informed ownership, we are talking here about clarity in the legal and regulatory framework and also in the expectations that the state has for SOEs. So it should be clear for companies uh, what requirements uh, what they need to fulfill in the area of anti-corruption and integrity. Uh, and there are a few different ways to do that. Um, and I can, I can explain a few of those. Uh, but we're also talking here about uh, how the state acts as an active and informed owner. So how they fulfill their own functions. So they need to monitor SOE performance. Um, they need to set disclosure policies um, and uh, assess ri risk exposure of the state, et cetera. So, so they need to be also conducting um, these activities with integrity. One question that appears in the implementation guide uh, is about the point I mentioned. So there needs to be clarity in the legal and regulatory framework. Um, and so what should the legal and regulatory framework cover is the question that we answer there. Um, and what does the state ownership entity then need to do to, to cover that? When it comes to country examples, um, we, we, I, I put an example here on the screen of, um, you know, how reporting systems uh, and monitoring systems can be used to assess SOE performance. Um, to make sure that SOEs are then aligned with the state's expectations on anti-corruption and integrity. Um, I highlight, for instance, just the one, the one example there in Brazil, which has made a lot of changes since, uh, the, um, since the Petrobras scandal in particular. Um, and they have now a monitoring tool that uh, evaluates all of the SOEs on the internal control and risk management um, setup. And it compares the SOEs as well across five set criteria. In Sweden, you have a sustainability analysis tool, which looks at integrity, but not only. There's other indicators that they're monitoring for the SOEs. When it comes to the third pillar on integrity at the company level, um, there are three sub areas we're looking at. So this is now where we're getting into what the state should recommend that the SOE does. So again, we're not making the recommendation directly to the SOE, it's first to the state, um, because the state should be setting clear expectations on what they, what they expect. So the first would be to encourage that companies have uh, sort of um, integrated risk management systems, that there's internal controls, ethics, compliance measures, um, and that very importantly, that the autonomy of of decision making bodies is is protected and so decision making bodies we primarily mean boards of directors but not only it could be uh, management boards and ex executive management too but this is particularly important for um, tackling the issue that i mentioned of the risk of undue influence by external parties in the company and so Professional boards and autonomous boards are just are absolutely key in this regard. Uh, one of the questions that the in implementation guide answers is what the components are of an integrated risk management system. Um, many, many of them are actually are in line with international standards, like COSO's ERM framework, for instance. Um, but they're also somehow tailored to the to the SOE uh, sector. Um, so that could be of interest uh, to companies who are on this on this call on this webinar. Um, and in terms of country examples, um, we have uh, a provision in the guidelines that say to um, uh, evaluate and the the effectiveness of boards performance and independence. And we have this in Denmark and Finland, for instance, in various ways. In Denmark, ministries um, have to assess board composition on a yearly basis. And in Finland, um, they do require yearly board evaluations. 
And finally, the fourth pillar um, is about accountability and enforcement. Now, this is where we talk about accountability and review mechanisms. So this could be SOEs or the state owner are uh, accountable to the legislature, um, that there is reporting, uh, annual reporting and external audit, very importantly. The second is that uh, if things go wrong or if there are irregularities, that action is taken and that there's due process. Now, one particularly important provision of the guidelines is that um, that due process is not uh, impeded or stopped because of national economic interest. And this is a provision that comes from the, um, the anti-bribery convention. So from the 1990s already, which said essentially that a company shouldn't be so important to the a state that the state is willing to um, essentially get in the way of due process. And so uh, a lot of stakeholders that we consulted when we were developing these guidelines said this is very important to include. Um, yes, so that's that's a point on 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 action and due respect for investigations or, or prosecutions where needed. And finally, then uh, we we suggest to invite the inputs of civil society. We know that um, or, or other stakeholders, because we know that in many cases that the media can play a very important role in uncovering cases of corruption um, or just generally um, poor poor practices in corporate governance. Um, private sector, uh, we recommend should have a better understanding of the nuances of the SOB sector. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that is the three areas of, of accountability that we cover. Um, one example again of of what the implementation guide covers is, you know, we we are getting asked, well, how independent should the Supreme Audit Institution be in general, but also, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the the SOE. Uh, and then in terms of country examples, um, we're asking that state bodies could be encouraged to cooperate with other stakeholders. So as you're doing already in this Transparent Integrity Academy, it's a good example of cooperation between bodies that are uh, very important for promoting integrity in a particular country. Um, and you see actually in Argentina, they have a policy dialogue too. Um, in, in Hungary, um, the, it's the Transparency International branch, so this is where we see a non-governmental organization getting involved and evaluating SOE's uh, transparency. So there are many different ways, again, that um, that other stakeholders are are getting involved. So this is all of the, this is an overview of, of all of the tools that we offer now and the types of details that you'll find in these documents. Um, so I'm essentially going to stop there on content. I just wanted to take a few moments to uh, to mention about the types of work that we're doing now uh, because we've we've finished the implementation guide um, and now we're moving towards supporting countries with the implementation. So how are we doing that? Um, one way is that we're we're starting to conduct thematic studies. Um, so for instance, in general, my team working on corporate governance wants to look at remuneration of boards or the green transition of SOEs. Um, we want to do a thematic study also on anti-corruption and integrity. Um, this could be, for instance, looking at undue influence in SOEs. Um, so this is, in my view, an exciting uh, way for us to go forward. We're also going to do reviews against the instrument. Um, it looks like maybe, uh, well, Ukraine, for instance, has expressed interest in being the first to have a review against the instrument. Uh, Lithuania, if it's of interest, of course, uh, could be one too. Uh, but this is where we would go in depth in a country and provide an analysis and, and recommendations for the country specifically. Um, we have also a project now um, called Compliance Without Borders, and uh, some of you have heard me discuss this in other events, or maybe you've heard about it. Um, the Compliance Without Borders project is actually a secondment program. Um, it's uh, an exchange program between private firms and SOEs that want to strengthen their anti-corruption compliance. So the idea is that actually private firms uh, for free, pro bono, 
lend one of their compliance or, or integrity experts to the SOE um, for a period of time to help consult and, and help the SOE strengthen particular aspects of their of their um, their compliance and their anti-corruption programs. Um, this is in a virtual format right now, um, but certainly if, if anyone is interested in this, would be I'd be happy to discuss this because I, I do think it's um it's quite a refreshing program um, for the OECD. Um, it's it's newer and uh, it's very practical. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, then we we are conducting capacity building activities and different events and seminars, you know, like the one that we're having today um, to share to share news about the guidelines. Um, and then finally, we had um, in 2019 um, what we called the SOE Anti-Corruption Day, and this was a, a full one day event in Paris, so in person. Um, covering all, a whole different range of topics related to the guidelines. And we would seek actually to do this again um, at a country level. We we are thinking, for instance, even about South Africa or taking it to a different continent, but uh, we hopefully will have another SOE anti-corruption day soon and you would all be certainly most welcome to join. So uh, if that comes to being, um, we'll, we'll certainly send out an invite um, to you all. So I've certainly spoken enough. Um, I will, I'm going to end it there, but I, I look forward to any questions you have um, or even follow up uh, by email hereafter. If you have any questions that come up later, I'm I'm always happy to be in touch about this. So uh, Ludas, I, I will leave it there. Thank, thank you very much. Alison, thank, thank you very much. Very much. Uh, this was, this a, was wonderful a wonderful presentation, presentation and I really appreciate, appreciate that. that. Um, um, I, I, I will, I will add, add a little, little bit of a uh, pressure, pressure to Drunas and, and Vida, that's right, right, to add to, add to the, the uh, invitation of yours. of yours. I think that, I think this, that this would be a great, be a great uh, opportunity for Lithuania to participate in, 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 in the reviews uh, uh, by, by the OECD. So so um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the guys will take the flag there. Um, I know that you have uh, to leave in 10 minutes. Uh, so let me give a couple of questions to you, which were popped popping up, right? And I think that I, I will start with a rather philosophical question, right? Because uh, uh, it, it was not once that you have mentioned uh, the importance of the tone at the top, right? And uh, as the state is a very, you know, huge organism and uh, as a huge beast, right? Uh, are there any tips and trips on, on how to set uh, the tone at the top correctly? whether this is a stick, a carrot, you know, how from the best examples you've seen, this is actually implemented that this would be a correct tone at the top? Yes, uh, very good question. Uh, and I think that this is a question both for, um, well, the answer, let's say, is not only about anti-corruption and integrity, but it's also about um, corporate governance, importantly. And I would say a couple of key things. Um, as I mentioned, SOEs ideally are operated as, as you know, as good practice listed companies. They're corporatized. They have autonomy. The boards have autonomy. And so that autonomy and that clarity in roles and responsibilities needs to be very clearly set. And the key here is, and to answer your question, I think, is that it needs to be respected all the time so that we don't have... Um, one-off, even one-off instances where those responsibilities or, or decisions are taken by the wrong level, because this indicates that, that that's fluid and it shouldn't really be fluid. It should be clearly set and state ownership entities or the governance coordination center should have its role. The state, um, the head of state, for instance, uh, or the, you know, the cabinet of ministers, whoever it may be, if they have a role in nominating um Nom and I say nominating, not appointing directly, but nominating, um, that that's, that's also clearly respected and that board's roles and decisions are clearly respected. And I think that's a first, that's a fundamental uh, point that we make both for integrity, but also corporate governance. Now, if you add then, so that's, that's fundamental. If you add a layer for specifically for integrity and anti-corruption, there are many ways that uh, states as a whole um, can can prioritize this. Maybe there's a national anti-corruption plan and SOEs are named specifically as part of that. 
um, maybe uh, there's a, even a clear expectation set from from the head of state about uh, about integrity in SOEs. But it doesn't have to be that necessarily. Um, off, most often we see the state ownership entity, again, in your case, VKC, I think, uh, making very clear the um, making very clear their uh, their expectations, like I said. So maybe there's an ownership policy, and in that they're talking about sustainability and performance of SOEs. And within that, here are the things we expect about integrity. And so that's the way they set the tone at the top. Um, it's not only but tasking, but also um, doing. So again, this is why we start with the guidelines with, with the integrity of the state. So that needs to be credible, of course. And if that's not credible, then, then it's very difficult to expect uh, SOEs to, to follow. Understood. And, and that, Alison, bridges uh, quite well with a question of five that was from the Ministry of Economy and Innovations, right? And then he gives the question about which, uh, in your opinion, uh, measures are the most effective to reduce political interference in the SOEs, right? Because uh, we've see, we've started the journey when accessing to OECD with depolitization, et cetera, et cetera. However, we've seen the cases that with the changes of the political powers, there were attempts to get to the politicization of the SOEs uh, again, right? So, what what, are you, what is your take on this? That is, uh, it's an excellent question. That's sort of the crux of many issues we see in different countries. Certainly, I mean, um, politicization of SOEs is a unfortunately all too common. Um, where you see the boards and even executive management changing with the political cycles. So it makes it very difficult, of course, even to just have continuity in terms of performance and, and operations. Uh, and then, of course, there's the corruption risk that comes with it. Um, I mentioned that we were trying to do some thematic studies. And at least personally, one thematic study that I would like to do uh, is, even, even this year maybe, is on looking at undue influence in SOEs. Because it's something that we know is a risk, but it's not systematically covered. So we have questions like this often, well, what do we do about it? And a lot of times um, the response is manage conflict of interest at the board. And that's very insufficient if there are powers at a higher level that are willing to work around that. You know, even conflict of interest declarations, sometimes they're aggregated and put on a shelf and no one even looks at them. So it's you know, I'm trying to look more broadly at um, what can be done. So to to the question on what can be done, again, key professionalism and autonomy of boards. But the the way that you get that too is, um, as you said, depoliticization of boards. Um, in some countries like Norway, they've gone as far as removing any state level representative from boards. So not even civil servants, just any representatives are off. That's one extreme way of doing it. The other is to have a minority or maybe one state representative on the board, but but to have a majority of, of independent board members. And independent means uh, non-state and non-company as well. We know that in other countries, independence can be, uh, can be just independent from the company, but for us, that's not the case. It should be a degree of independence. Um, obviously integrity at the state level but but so protecting boards and also executive management and one thing is key there that again decisions need to be taken at the right level and we do not recommend it's actually explicit that it's the board who appoints the ceo uh and good practice would be also other members of executive management because we do not want where the state is bypassing the board to appoint management because then the board just becomes a rubber stamp in many cases Alison, um, I do see that you have to go, really. Um, I see a question still of five that us load, so let's give it a shot. For the yeah, sure. I can take, yeah, I'll take just a few more before I run. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you, first of all, for a very informative and relevant presentation. So I have a chance to ask one more question. Please. Uh, yeah, it's actually a difficult question but in one of your slides you mentioned that for example if i rem remember correctly in switzerland the employees could not be the shareholders of the soes or something like yeah. uh yeah what would be your opinion on employee stock options uh, should the soes apply such a motivational system to employees or executive or board members 
or maybe to grant uh, shares of stock directly because of the part of KPI's achievement. So what would be your opinion on that? Because we have exact case in Lithuania and we are, have very uh, hard discussions and an yeah. emotional case here. So mm -hmm. it, it's all over the press, right? Okay. So I think that, you know, don't, don't be pressured to... <laughs> so yeah. What's your take on this? Okay, I noticed this is being recorded. So yeah, I'm going to be careful. <laughs> it's it's a very good question. Um, and I actually, because it is a more technical question, I could get you more details, especially because it's a, an important question in the country right now. I could get you more details in writing because I would take more time in, in analyzing. But I do know that, so my reference on the PowerPoint was to um, representatives of the state ownership entity. Uh, in some cases being limited from holding shares in the SOEs that they're responsible for monitoring, which makes sense, of course. Um, we do know that uh, both, of course, executive, but at, at board levels, um, they are often allowed to hold shares in the SOE, but many countries are also not allowing that. So there is a variety of approaches in that, and that's what I would like to look in more detail before I, you know, so to speak, put my foot in my mouth. So I would, I, would, I would stop there, but it is an important subject and it is somewhat related also to board remuneration because here we're talking about um, the incentives that board members have to monitor the SOE performance, but also have the SOE perform. And so when we're talking about boards needing to oversee and be attentive to potential corruption risks or raise a red flag or whistleblow, whatever it may be, if they have incentives that compete with that, then we can be in a problematic situation. So, so we all that to say too, with regards at least to the remuneration and what board members get paid, we're looking into this in more detail too, because it's not an evident answer. It, it is a complex situation and the OECD, and to my knowledge, no other organization has looked in a systematic way at what board members should be paid and also the stock options too. So, because it is a politically sensitive thing and it varies across country. Invite us. I think that this is why we should invite the OECD for the uh, review in Lithuania to get more insights there. So, Alison, uh, if if possible, I see Linus uh, raising the hand, and I would like to to have this question answered as well. So, Linus, I, I think that the floor is yours, and we will close with this question the discussion. Hello, thank you, Ludas, for opportunity. So uh, I have actually several questions, and the first one is uh, <laughs> when we are speaking about integrity and and the corruption uh, environment in SOEs. Uh, you know, we have in Lithuania more than 240 municipality-owned enterprises, and should the uh, same standards of anti-corruption integrity apl be applied to them and all the recommendations that are made uh, from OECD for the state and ministries be the same recommendations for municipalities? And the second question is about the uh, responsibility of um, integrity and anti-corruption as a whole, because uh, as we have a guideline now, it is um, about the responsibility for state to promote the integrity and anti-corruption in SOEs, but uh, it seems like we leave aside the state-owned enterprises and their responsibility for implementing anti-corruption uh, cor corruption prevention measures. So where is where should be the burden of responsibilities between state and the enterprise where they should participate in uh, promoting integrity? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lina. So those are those are really excellent questions. Um, with regards to the first one um, on municipally municipally owned SOEs, uh, yes, we get this question a lot. There are it is very common that there are a huge number of of SOEs owned at the municipal level or the local level. Um, we don't really at the OECD tend to touch on that. We're more focused on the national level, but we do say that. Uh, um, subnationally owned SOEs should aspire to implementing the the provisions of the guidelines that make sense. But even for SOEs owned at the national level that are smaller, say, some of the provisions are going to be out of reach, at least for a while, because they simply do not have the number of people in the capacity to do the things that are being recommended. So, and again, it's it's uh, they're ambitious anyway. As I said, no OECD country has implemented this in full. So 
the aspiration is there. Companies should, in my view, at the municipal level, be expected to, at the very least, comply with the regulatory requirements. Uh, but certainly the, the expectations should be for that uh, owners at the state level or subnational level and uh, companies at the subnational level to also not just comply, but to promote integrity uh, in, in their operations. Um, it's, it's about strategy and performance and also managing risks to performance too. It's not just about integrity for the well-being of everyone. It's, it's about, you know, meeting, meeting your expectations and managing risks to that. Um, so with regards to your second question too on the, the broader responsibility, uh, I guess my answer is that it should be both. You know, the, our guidelines focus on the state, of course, because again, OECD, that's, those are our, our counterparts. Um, but it does need to be both, certainly. And so this is why we have a whole pillar dedicated to the state owner, what they should do, but what they should recommend the company does. And what's in what we suggest the company does is based on international standards for good practice in companies. So as I mentioned, with regards to risk management, we've integrated into that COSO's enterprise risk management. Um, and so we, we did a whole range of uh, an analysis of a whole range of, of private uh, company requirements and good, stat, good practices, and they're integrated in there. Um, I would say too, of course, um, the SOE, uh, SOEs are the ones that have to comply as well. I mean, they, for legality purposes, at, at a minimum, they should be compliant. But we do see a lot of companies, more and more SOEs, um, going beyond the legal requirements and, I, and working towards a culture of integrity and saying, hey, we, we want to be recognized as a company that's sustainable and uh, is good to work with and is reliable. We want foreign investment and we're going to track that in foreign investment by showing that we are meeting international expectations on anti-corruption and integrity. Uh, and and that seems to be working. I mean, also there there's the changing tide, more generally about companies applying ESG standards, for instance, environmental, social, and governance. And this is part of it. You know, uh, companies that can demonstrate that they are able to adapt and um, and and meet societal expectations. And so those are the ones we think that are going to be able to stay ahead and not get lost. Um, uh, left behind in that sense. So, so the expectations are are for both. That's a burden that should be shared. Okay, thank you very much, Allison. Um, I do have a ton of questions there written down because uh, the presentation was very, very interesting, and there are many details there. But in the closing remarks, I think that you know I would just encourage uh, all of the participants uh, of, of of this conference of this webinar. Uh, to take the guide, even if this is 100 uh, pages long, I think that this is a very, very interesting read for the integrity professionals. Um, I think that uh, the second workshop, a practical workshop, deserves to be made internally. Uh, therefore, we would discuss and, you know, get the questions, that get the cases out there. And then uh, I, I would be very happy to see you again um, in... in, in uh, I don't know, September, uh, October there, for the practical workshop there, either in-house in Lithuania and in person, right? Or uh, via webinar as we have it today. Um, so on this, uh, Alison, thank you very much. Um, really, really appreciate on behalf of all the participants here. My pleasure, really. Thanks again for the invitation and, and I'm happy to, let's, let's stay in touch and I'm happy to keep, um, to keep discussing. So don't hesitate if there's questions in the meantime too. Sorry, I have to go. Sure. <laughs> well, thank sure. you again. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye all. Thanks. Bye bye. Um, Edvinai, aš galbūt uh, gražinu žodį tau, ar ne, ir, ir, ir uh, vaido tai žydrūnai, jeigu norite uh, baigiamą žodį irgi iš savo pusės uh, pasakyti, nes tikrai daug, uh, daug minčių buvo pasakyta ir daug kvietimų dalyvauti įvairiose uh, iniciatyvose. Tai gražinu jums žodį ir galim turbūt uždaryt šiandieninę diskusiją. Ok. Taip, tai jeigu daugiau nėra norinčių pasisakyti tiesiog tokie techniniai dalykai, tai dar kartą ačiū visiems dalyvausiams. Aš labai tikiuosi, kad buvo naudinga ir pasisėmėte gerų žinių. Mes pasidalinsim Alison prezentaciją 
elektroninių paštų, atsiūsim kiekvienam. Ir taip pat atsiūsim ir nuordas į jau minėtus šios nusitikime EBPO leidinius. Tai galėsite susipažinti ir pasiskaityti ir pasižiūrėti, kas galėtų būti prie tą kitą jūsų pačių veikloje. Tai tiek būtų iš mano pusės, tai dar kartą ačiū ir iki sekai. Taip, prašau, dar baidėtas renka pakėlės. Taip, aš nebespėjau jau sureaguoti į pačią liūdą į kvietimą dalyvautojų ICD iniciatyvose, tai mes turbūt įsivertinsim galimybės ir reikėtų sistemizuotis, kokios tos tiksliai iniciatyvos, na, iš tikro projekta yra įdomus tema, yra aktuali, tai būtų galima pasigalvoti ir pabaigai norėjau dar pačiam padėkoti ir už gražų moderavimą šito rengio ir iš kvietimą į į šią diskusiją kolegoms iš STT taip pat. Tai didelis dėkui visiems, tai Skaidrumo akademijai visų pirma, aš manau, kad tikrai yra nuostabinė iniciatyva, aš vis tiek paraginsiu visus čia esančius perskaityti patį gydą, vėlgi pasikartosiu, manau, kad jisai labai labai gerai surašytas, paprastai praktiškai surašytas, Jeigu tik matytumėm naudingą, manau, kad būtų nuostabus toks follow-up renginys ir diskusija dėl, ką galim padaryti su to praktiniu gaidu ir kad jisai reiktų Lietuvai. Žydrūnai. Taip, sveiki dar kartą. Tai, liūdai, aš irgi prisidedu prie visų šitų, sakim, padėko žodžių. Tai Liūdas yra ekspertas Skaidrumo akademijoje ir matyt, kad šiandienos webinaras ir buvo pavyzdys to, kad darant kasdieninius darbus ir galvojant dar truputį šalia ir apie Skaidrumo akademiją, galime padaryti dvi guba naudą. Tai yra pasiekti ir savo tojom kasdieninėm darbe atliekamų tikslų, bet ir pasidalinti tuo su tai žmonėm, kam tai gali būti svarbu Lietuvoje ir pasiekti truputį platesnį efektą ir truputį platesnį naudą. Tai Skaidrumo akademija įsibėgėja, ačiū visiems, plėskim truputį akiratį, matykim plačiau, kaip sakau, nesam mes tie tokie išskirtiniai, neturim kažkokių kitokių, tik mums būdingų korupcijos priežasčių ir situacijos visi turi tą patį vadinas, jeigu kažkas sugalvojo geriau, jeigu kažkas apibūdino, apibendrino, vadinkim taip gerąją praktiką, tai yra pats patogiausias kelias ją paimti ir pasižiūrėti, o kur mes ją galim pritaikyti Lietuvoje. Tai ačiū dar kartą už renginį, iš tiesų buvo įdomu, kitaip, nei kiti renginiai, truputį plačiau, truputį išėjom už Lietuvos ribų apie Skaidrumo akademiją, ką girdime jau žino ir užsienio ekspertai, tai yra smagu ir jeigu ta geraja praktika jau dalinasi su kitom valstybėm, vadinas mes einam iš tiesų teisinga, Galbūt dar nepramintų kelių, bet teisinga kriptim ir darykim tą. Darykim tą ir visi dėkim norų, kad tai duotų rezultatų. Ačiū visiems už šiandien dieną ir gerų darbų. Ačiū visiems. Ačiū. Puikim. Ačiū žiūrėginį. Liūdai dar, kadangi visi jau išvaiginėjasi viskas, tai tiesiog asmeniškai. Jo, jo, rekordingas sustabdyka čia mūsų individualių diskusijų neįrašinėtų. Tuoj kolegams pranešu apie rekordingą. Nes man kažkodėl tai teamsai neleido opcijos daryti į rekordingą. Tai aš paprašiu, kad kolegai rašinėtų, tuoj parašysiu, kad atjungtų jau. Pats kui mes vis tiek nukirpsim tą pabaigą, kai jau. Taip, cenzuruosim. Kaip tau, kaip įspūdis, Edvinai? Man atrodo, kad labai labai taip su techninė pradžia turbūt prisijungimo, bet kai įsivažiavom, tai visai... Jo, 
Kad ir ta techninė, tas nesklandumas, jis gana gražiai paskui perėjom prie Vaidoto ir, ir paskui prisijungė Žydrūnas, tai toks tas mes sklandus perėjimas buvo, nebuvo kažkokių tai sustojimų ilgesnių. Man tai atrodo, kad tikrai geras pristatymas, naudingas ir, ir visi norintis galėjo pasiklausti, užduoti klausimus. Tai tikrai džiugu dėlelės, kad jis tokia, na, kaip sakyt, 